It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, good morning, Speaker, and my question is for the Premier. Providing honest testimony under oath is a core principle of justice in this province, and I think that's, and I hope that's something we can all agree on. The Premier told the Integrity Commissioner that he was, quote, not immediately familiar with Greenbelt speculator Sergio Mancha because he meets apparently thousands of people, he said. Yet senior political staff were texting each other that the Premier, quote, needs to stop calling this guy. My question to the Premier is, what is the nature of his relationship with Sergio Mancha? And to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. Very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As we've uh, said on a number of occasions, uh, and as has been uh, uh, both confirmed by both the Integrity Commissioner and the uh, Auditor uh, General, uh, the uh, the Premier, of course, did not have knowledge of uh, of uh, the lands with respect to the Green Bill. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I've also been very, very clear that uh, I was uh, unhappy with uh, with the uh, uh, the political involvement, uh, political staff involvement, uh, with respect to the official plans. Uh, that is why I briefed the Premier on it, and he asked me to, uh, uh, to repeal the provincial changes to those uh, official plans. We've done that, Mr. Speaker, and we're moving forward to make sure that we can build 1.5 million homes by working with our municipal partners, and we'll get that job done. Supplementary question. It should have been an easy one to answer, I think, Speaker. Uh, but, Speaker, it's not just the phone calls. Uh, the Premier testified that he was not involved in any way with site selection of greenbelt removals, and his first time viewing them was on November 2, 2022. He further testified that he had no recollection of meeting Mr. Mancha and had no recollection of any conversations with him about the greenbelt. Now we have a new document, Speaker, that seems to contradict the Premier's testimony. It shows he had a meeting with Mr. Mancha, the then, and also the then mayor of Hamilton, and the member from Flamborough Glanbrook on September 20, 2021, where they all agreed to pursue removing lands from the Greenbelt. So my question is to the Premier again. Can the Premier confirm he met with Mr. Mancha in 2021 to discuss site-specific Greenbelt removals? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is my understanding that this particular individual has been advocating for the removal of those lands from the Greenbelt uh, uh, for many, many, many years and is, uh, has met with, uh, with every Premier uh, uh, in the entirety that he's held uh, those lands, uh, Speaker. Uh, we made the decision. We made a decision with respect to the Greenbelt that was uh, not accepted by the people of the province of Ontario. That is why we reversed that decision. At the same time, uh, after reviewing the, the changes to the official plans that were made by the province, uh, the decision was made that there was too much involvement from political staff in that, and that's why after, a, after uh, uh, I was given the opportunity to brief the Premier on that, he asked me to uh, repeal the provincial changes. We're doing Order. that at the same time, uh, Speaker. Uh, our municipalities will have the opportunity to provide additional comment over the next uh, 45 days to uh, uh, some of the changes that they would like to see in those original official Response. plans that they had uh, provided some, uh, some years ago. We will move forward. We will continue to ensure that we can uh, meet our goal of building 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Final supplementary. Speaker, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but it, it only gets worse. The Premier says he doesn't remember Mr. Mancha. Remember, we, we just re reviewed that. But Mr. Mancha hosted an intimate $1,200 a ticket fundraiser for the Conservative Party at his home, also on September 20, 2021, and the Premier was there. In fact, new reporting indicates that the promise to remove Mr. Mancha's land from the Greenbelt happened at that very fundraiser. So to the Premier, does the Premier remember Mr. Manchin now? Did he provide assurances he would remove Greenbelt lands at a private fundraiser for the Conservative Party? Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The Premier has been clear. No, he did not. At the same time, that has been also uh, 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 been made clear through the Auditor General's report as well as the Integrity Commissioner's uh, report. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, as I said, this particular gentleman and others who own lands in the Greenbelt uh, have been advocating amongst for years to have lands put uh, taken out of the Greenbelt. They've met with many premiers, many members uh, of all uh, of all parties, uh, Speaker. 
uh, we made a public policy decision that was not supported by the people. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is build 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. We've reversed the Greenbelt uh, decision, Mr. Speaker, but let me be also very, very clear. We will not stop on our goal of building 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. We will double down. We will work with our municipal friends to ensure that we build those 1.5 million homes. We will hold our municipal Pause. partners accountable, and at the same time, we will hold developers and home builders accountable with a new use it or lose it, Mr. Speaker. We're in a crisis, and we will get the job done. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. So once again, none of this story is adding up, Speaker. Uh, so back to the Premier. I'm not the only one who is going to be questioning the discrepancy between the Premier's testimony and the growing mountain of evidence. I would bet that the RCMP's special prosecutor, who is investigating the alleged criminal corruption of this by this government, is going to be interested too. So I would ask the Premier, would the Premier like to take the opportunity to correct the record? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Here, and again, as I've said on a number of occasions, we will assist uh, uh, anybody, uh, the RCMP or uh, the Integrity Commissioner, anybody who's doing work on this. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are going to continue to move forward on our goal of building 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Look, Speaker, we are in a housing crisis in the province of Ontario, ostensibly because the Liberals and NDP put obstacles after obstacle after obstacle in the way of building homes. We became one of the least uh, uh, enviable jurisdictions in order to do business. In fact, industries that had been the pillar of Ontario's economy for decades had said that they could no longer do business in the province of Ontario, Speaker. That all changed in 2018 when we doubled down to ensure that we cut red tape, that we reduced taxes for our small, medium and large job creators. We've reduced taxes for, uh, for families, Response. making life more Order. affordable for them. It is the Liberals and the NDP who stand against families, stand against affordability. We're going to do all all that we can to improve the economy and keep it growing. Supplementary. Uh, well, well, Speaker, they've replaced that red tape with brown envelopes and USB keys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaker, uh, the Premier also testified that he had no conversations, no conversations about the Gormley Go station area prior to November 4th, 2022. But minutes from a meeting on October 13th, three weeks earlier, Speaker, say, Gormley, decision on areas is with the Premier's office right now, and goes on to say, by the way, Speaker, the Premier doesn't understand the lands are in the Oak Ridges Moraine. Back to the Premier, could he clarify his testimony? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Hey, uh, as I said yesterday, I actually campaigned in it's online in two elections to have the Gormley lands taken out of the Greenbelt and made available for Whitchurch Stovall to develop. Of course, the Premier, on both occasions when I've advocated for it, said absolutely not, has turned me down on both occasions. The Gormley lands were never taken out of the Greenbelt. The Mayor of Stovall, the Mayor of Stovall asked for them to be redesignated as part of the official plan. The region of York pulled that out, Mr. Speaker, and that's where we're at, uh, Speaker. It is so important that we continue to build on our goal of 1.5 million. They're going to stand in the way of all of it. Like, I mean, there's no secret, right? They're against municipal zoning orders that build social housing in their ridings. They're against ministerial zoning orders that build long-term care. They're literally against everything that Order. is moving the province Order. forward, Mr. Order. Speaker. They have cornered Response. the market on saying no. We have cornered the market on building a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario, and we'll double down to do it. The final supplementary. Those lands, those lands were redesignated, and the minister knows that. Yeah. The premier testified he was not involved in any way with site selection before November 2, 2022. He repeated the same claims to the media just yesterday. But now we know he was discussing a site-specific removal with Mr. Mancha a year earlier. And we just keep finding more evidence. Meeting notes that say the Premier's office wants this done, that the Premier's office asked for a picture to make sure it's captured. So to the Premier, does he still expect people to believe that he wasn't involved from the start? Wonderful. Please take their seats. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
Again, uh, both the Integrity Commissioner and uh, the Auditor General have confirmed the same. So I would suggest to the members opposite, if they don't have Order. faith in either of those two uh, officers of Parliament, they should table a motion in front of this House saying that they don't have uh, confidence in either of those two officers. Stop the clock. The member for Hamilton Mountain will withdraw her unparliamentary remarks. Which one? Order. Order. Restart the clock. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has the floor. I'll, I'll conclude by saying this. Today I was joined by the Minister of Finance uh, in Toronto. Uh, where we announced that the province of Ontario will be eliminating the HST, so 13 percent tax on purpose-built rentals. And you know what they're doing there, Mr. Speaker? Two towers, I think 26 and 21 floors of rental, rental housing for the people of uh, Toronto, Mr. Speaker. That is just the start. We are seeing purpose-built rentals at record levels in this province. Record levels for the past 30 years, they have never hit the targets that they are hitting today. And that's response. what we're going to continue to do. Double down on policies that bring housing to the people of the province of Ontario. They're against it. We'll remove the obstacles and remove the taxes. To the next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. I guess, I guess Speaker, they just want to drag this all out. Yeah. An internal document from this week's latest pile of evidence discusses a change to York Region's official plan that would reclassify 29 hectares of Vaughan lands owned by the Milani family and designate it for future development. These lands are also located within the Oak Ridge's moraine in the Greenbelt. The document includes commentary from Ryan Amato, who reportedly said, and I quote, Speaker, Premier's office wants this done. So this question is to the Premier. Why did his office want this done? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, what we want done is we want to build more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Full stop, right? You heard, we, we don't want to drag anything on. We want to get down to the business of building more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. That's why we brought policies to this House to do just that. That's why they have voted against every single one of those measures. When the Minister of Finance every brings in a bill to reduce, to eliminate taxes on purpose-built rentals, they'll vote against it. Yep. When the Minister of Infrastructure brings a bill forward to build transit faster, Order. they vote against it. When we bring a bill that would build uh, homes around transit, transit-oriented communities, they vote against it. When we bring a bill forward to eliminate the lowest income earners from the proper, from tax rolls, they vote against it. When the minister brought in a bill to double, uh, to increase ODSP rates and to put it towards inflation, Response. The market towards inflation, they vote against it. They vote literally against everything. Order. They stand for literally Order. nothing, and that is why that party is so divided and spending more time fighting each other than fighting each other. Order. Order. The final supplementary. Speaker, it's not about building homes. It's about who gets government favors just because they're conservative insiders. Late last year, Speaker, late last year, the former minister added a, I want a, a special provision to York's official plan just so those specific greenbelt lands could be developed. And remember, those lands were owned by the Milani family. The Milani family and their companies have donated more than $100,000 to the Conservative Party over the last 10 years. So, Speaker, I need to ask to the Premier, what is the going rate for a lucrative land deal in this province? Well, members will take their seats. Mr. An odd question, since the member for St. Catharines announced somebody who's here with the Co-op Housing Federation who serves on her board, on her Electoral District Association, I'm sure that person is doing really good work on behalf of the association that he represents, and also good work for the party, Mr. Speaker. You can have it both ways, but what we're doubling down on is this, building more homes for the people of the province of Ontario, eliminating red tape so that we can get more homes in the ground, Mr. Shovels in the ground, Mr. Speaker, eliminating taxes so that we can have more purpose-built 
Order. rentals, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that the people of the province of Ontario can share in the exact same dream that millions of people who came to this country have always had, the dream of home ownership. Now, we know, Mr. Speaker, we know that the party opposite, they're against immigration, Mr. Speaker. They're against building homes, Mr. Speaker. They're against working people. The member for Sudbury can't get the order off his face because he's Response. against the miners in his own community time and time again. So if it was up to them, our economy would sink, there would be no homes built, Mr. Speaker, and the people would only rely on government. We want the people to rely on themselves. Order. The next question. The member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. The carbon tax is driving up the cost of utilities as it is driving up the cost of everything. People across our province are struggling, and life is more unaffordable today because of the imposition of the federal carbon tax. Sadly, many individuals and families are worried about how to pay order. for home heating and are forced to make difficult Opposition decisions. Opposition come to order. Businesses and organizations are also feeling the same pressure from the carbon tax. They worry about their financial future and the ability to continue to provide goods and services to the people in their communities. Speaker, can the minister please explain the financial impact the carbon tax increases are having on the people of Ontario? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Energy. Thanks, Speaker. I think the one thing we can agree on is that there's an affordability crisis across Canada right now, and it's because of the carbon tax. And what did the federal Liberal government do last week? They carved out their staple policy, the carbon tax, but only in Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker, off home heating oil, which affects 2.5 percent of Ontario residents, Mr. Speaker. Over 70 percent are using natural gas. The carbon tax is adding $300 on a natural gas bill. It's adding $250 on propane users' bills across the province, Mr. Speaker. We've been doing everything we can on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that life is more affordable. Just yesterday, the Minister of Finance and the Premier announcing that we are extending the gasoline uh, rebate uh, to $0.10 cents a litre until mid-next year, Mr. Speaker. While we're doing that, the Feds are continuing to drive up the cost of gasoline by $0.14 cents a litre this year with the carbon tax and plans to triple it over the next number Spons. of years. We're working Working closely with the federal government, Mr. Speaker, let us help you get this right. Reduce the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question, back to the. Thank you, Speaker. It's clear from the minister's response that our government has always been a steadfast opponent of the federal carbon tax. However, the negative impact of the carbon tax cannot be overstated. I received emails and calls from constituents sharing how the price of gas and food has dramatically increased, creating daily hardships. Drivers are forced to pay more at the pumps because of the carbon tax. And while our government has showed much needed leadership and reduced the gasoline tax, sadly, the federal government has not. Instead, they increased fuel and gasoline costs by 14 cents forcing individuals, families and businesses to pay more, all because of the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain what action needs to be taken to respond to the negative impact that Question. the federal carbon tax is having on the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thanks again uh, to the member opposite for the question. It's obviously impacting the price of everything that we buy, Mr. Speaker, from gasoline at the pumps to our home heating fuels to the groceries in our grocery stores, Mr. Speaker. It's costing more because of the federal carbon tax. And as we heard uh, earlier this week as well from Governor of the Bank of Canada, it's also having a massive impact on inflation as well. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite from the Liberal Party knows exactly what happened when bad energy policy policy is presented. His Order. party was reduced to a minivan party Order. on not just one election, but two elections, Mr. Speaker. I'm concerned for the federal Liberal Party under Justin Trudeau Order. that they're heading down this same bumpy road, Mr. Speaker, that they're going to be reduced to a minibus party, Mr. Speaker, if Response. they don't do the right thing. Work with us. Help us help you and reduce the carbon tax on everything, every which Order. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. 
Next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, as reported by the Trillium today, last year the former Minister of Municipal Affairs approved amendments to Peel's official plan that would allow the development of a golf course located inside the Greenbelt Fingers in Caledon. The beneficiaries of this change include Michael Rice and members of the DeGasperis family. The Auditor General found that the Ministry gave Mr. Rice and the DeGasperis family preferential treatment when their lands were removed from the Greenbelt last year. So, Speaker, my question is, did they also receive preferential treatment when the former minister approved these changes to Peel's official plan? And to respond, the Premier. To you, Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to inform the NDP where the public's mind is. The public's mind is about the high mortgage rates, that people are losing their houses because of mortgage rates. They're concerned about the high gas prices. And that's why yesterday's announcement Order. was massive, deducting 10 cents per litre off each litre of gas. And I know you, you don't believe in driving cars. I know you guys don't. You don't believe in, in building roads and highways and bridges. We, we know that because you vote against it every single time. Come to order. They believe in getting rid of the tolls on the 412 and 418, but you don't believe in building any, any roads and highways, as I said, but you also don't believe in building long-term care. You don't believe in building hospitals because you vote against us order. on every single issue. And my friends in the mining, Response. by the way, I'm heading up to Sudbury to do another robocall to tell the people of Sudbury their own member doesn't support the mining industry. The Premier will take his seat. The Premier will take his seat. I'll remind the House to make their comments through the chair and that when the Speaker rises, you sit. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, you know what people are thinking across this province? Yeah. How they're going to keep a roof over their head. Yeah. And they want transparency and accountability from this Premier yeah. and this government. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, this change to Peel's official plan was requested by Quinto Annabelle, who is the Premier's hand-picked LCBO vice chair and major PC donor. Mr. Annabelle, along with Michael de Gasperis, were also involved in Vaughan working families which il the, whose illegal ad campaign against teachers triggered an RCMP investigation just two years ago. Yep. And Michael Rice had hired another friend of the Premier, Nico Fideni Diker, who lobby to lobby in support of projects in Caledon and Peel. Mr. Fidani Diker attended the Premier's daughter's wedding reception just last year. So, Speaker, the question is, did the Premier or any of his staff direct ministry's officials concerning this change to Peel's official plan? Members will please take their seats. The Premier. Mr. Speaker, unless the NDP didn't notice, we pulled that back. I apologize to the province. We're moving forward. But, Mr. Speaker. Order. That, 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 member, that member Position that just spoke, Mr. Speaker, from Scarborough, you know, maybe she should focus on Scarborough. She voted against the brand new hospital we're building for Scarborough. She voted against the subway that people have been waiting for decades out in Scarborough. She voted against the long term care we're putting out in Scarborough. Maybe, maybe she should get her priorities straight and focus on what people are concerned about right now, and that's pocketbook issues. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Burlington. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Oh, great minister. The carbon tax imposed by the federal government is negatively impacting the people and businesses of Ontario. The carbon tax raises the price on everything, especially for businesses and manufacturers who have no choice but to either take a financial hit or pass the costs on to consumers. That's right. Our government understands that lowering taxes actually increases revenue, yes. creates jobs, and boosts the economy. Unfortunately, the independent Liberals and opposition NDP are working against affordability. Shame. They continue oh, to support yeah. the carbon tax and vote against measures our government has implemented to help businesses start 
start and grow. How could you? Speaker, Question. the minister, please share his views on how the carbon tax impacts Ontario's businesses. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. When, uh, speaker, <clears throat> when we speak to companies all across the globe, they're so excited by what Ontario has to offer. It's our educated workforce. It's our low business costs. It's our innovative ecosystem. All of this and so much more. But the one concern they all bring up because they don't understand this is this federal carbon tax. We look at our neighbors in the U.S. $460 billion in two-way trade, and they ask us, what the heck is this carbon tax that you have? They want to think twice about investing and expanding in Ontario. Simply put, this carbon tax has stifled our growth across our economy. Every business in every, bu in every sector has seen their costs grow up because of this terrible Response. carbon tax. Speaker, our message to the federal government is very simple. Get rid of this tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The Minister is absolutely right. Ontario can boast about the many successes we've witnessed in our province due to lowering the cost of doing business. A carbon tax never creates jobs and never provides more affordability. Its only purpose is to punish Ontario families and businesses. Only one member from the Liberal caucus understood the negative impacts of the carbon tax and joined us in fighting to lower prices for all Ontarians. Yes. Yes. It's time for the rest of the Liberal members who are still saying no to our motion to remove the carbon tax to do the right thing, to do it now, and to vote to scrap it. Exactly. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our economy can thrive without the need for a harmful costly and unfair carbon tax. Great question. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, our government has proved that you can fight for the environment while keeping costs low. We reduced the cost of doing business by $8 billion a year, and that has brought $27 billion worth of EV business here in Ontario in three years. Those investments are to provide our end-to-end -end electric vehicle supply chain. So we are going to be producing every component of clean emissions-free EVs right here in Ontario. Speaker, we are at the center of the environmental uh, progress here in Ontario. Unfortunately, the federal government has taken the opposite approach. Their crushing carbon tax is making everything more expensive while Response. doing absolutely nothing to fight, to fight climate change. We want them to scrap that tax today. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For weeks on this side of the House, we have demanded that the government fire Mr. Phil Verster, CEO of Metrolinx, because of his many failures under his watch. But this gentleman earns a million dollars a year, Speaker, and he's just had his contract renewed for three years. But yesterday, we learned that the government has removed Janet Ecker, a former Tory cabinet minister, from the Metrolinx board in the middle of her term. Reports suggest that it was due to a column she wrote that criticized the, quote, chaotic decision-making process, unquote, that led to the Greenbelt fiasco. Speaker, to the Premier, what message is he trying to send? Is it that the Premier can excuse gross incompetence with Mr. Verster, but criticism will not be tolerated? To reply, Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, in, under, uh, since being appointed uh, Minister of Transportation, I'm seeking a refresh of the Metrolinx board. Uh, and with that, Mr. Speaker, we have one of the largest transit expansion sure, plans yeah. in the history uh, of this province and also in North America, $70 billion over the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker. And let the record show that the members opposite have voted against oh, each and oh, every yeah. single one of those investments, yeah, whether it's building the Ontario line, 
partner. Will take, uh, the opposition will come to order. 400,000 people every single day. They voted against that, whether it's the Scarborough subway extension, which for years under the previous Liberal government was talked about with no action. Under the leadership of this Premier, we have Spons. shoveled in the ground, Mr. Speaker. We are going to continue to do whatever we can to build transit across this province. The supplementary question, back to the member for Ottawa Centre. Oh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. I, I heard what my friend just said over there about a refresh at Metrolinx. Let's be clear. The refresh was restricted to one board member, mm -hmm. and that one board member on September 26 wrote an op-ed criticizing this government's internal culture. And then she was removed from the Metrolink sport. Shame. But Mr. Verster, Speaker, he still has his job. He makes a million dollars a year while he's presiding over failure, and we have serious transit issues in Ontario. We actually have a $500 million hole in operating funding across transit agencies in Ontario. Fares are going up, and service is getting worse. So will this government get serious about the transit system we have? not the systems they want to exist someday, the buses and trains and streetcars we have, and make sure that they get the $500 million that they need, they fire Mr. Verster right now, and insist we get our transit system back on track. Great. Members will take their seats. The Minister of Transportation can reply. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite and the official uh, opposition have done nothing to support transit in this province. When we came uh, forward with record and historic investments opposition to support transit to systems across this province during the pandemic, the members opposite voted against that, Mr. Speaker. When we've put forward these historic investments to build and continue to maintain uh, these uh, transit projects across the province, the members opposite have voted against that, whether it be the Ontario line for the people of Toronto, the Scarborough subway extension, the, here, uh, the Hazel McCallion line LRT uh, in Mississauga and in, and in Brampton, or, Mr. Speaker, the uh, new extensions, the Finch West LRT. The members opposite every single time when given the chance to stand up to build a world-class transit system across this province have always stood in the way of progress, Mr. Order. Speaker. We will not take Pause. any lessons from the official opposition on how to build transit. We're going to continue to move forward on a $70 billion plan over the next 10 years to make Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. We know from the sound work of the Auditor General and the Integrity Commissioner on the $8.3 billion Greenbelt scandal that this government has been meddling in land development processes to benefit their friends. The government's now under criminal investigation by the RCMP for potential wrongdoing related to these development changes. Speaker, the public knew and opposition members knew from the beginning that the Greenbelt changes and municipal boundary changes smelled bad. Similarly, Mr. Speaker, changes to Toronto's Midtown and Focus plans smell bad too. The Midtown plan for Toronto, developed in, with extensive consultation, was thrown out by this government without any consultation with the city or its residents. My question to the Premier, given the government's track record of political interference in land development, can the Premier assure the people of Don Valley West and Toronto that there was no political meddling in the decision to overturn the Midtown and Focus Plan, yes or no? To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we are, uh, we are working with the City of Toronto actually very closely uh, with respect uh, to their official plan. We're also working uh, uh, with them on a host of uh, other issues, uh, uh, Speaker, issues that frankly have been brought on by the members' federal party, a federal party that refuses to pay for its share of services in the, in the City of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, we have shelters that are bursting at the seams because of the policies of the federal Liberal government. Now, this finance minister and this premier have stepped up to the plate and are providing funding to the city of Toronto. The federal government has yet to match that funding as they should be doing. We are working very closely with the city of Toronto, as I said on its official plan. We are working very closely with them. Uh, the Minister of Finance is leading a team to ensure that uh, we can address some of the challenges that they are being uh, that they are faced ostensibly because of policies of the federal Response. Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. So if the member wants to be helpful, she can call 1-800-Justin and help them get see the light, and so that we can get. Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. 
once again we get empty rhetoric, spin doctoring, and pointing to our federal partners instead of a, res a serious response to a serious question about this government's ethics and decisions. Okay. My community had a plan in place to ensure thoughtful, deliberate density. But now the proposed developments in my community have big signs from the TD TDSB and Catholic School Board warning future residents that their children will be unable to go to school in their own communities. That's not responsible development, it's not good for community building, and it's not good for safety. Speaker, city staff, residents, and elected officials did not ask for this change to the official Midtown plan. In fact, quite the opposite. They continue to be shocked and outraged by the irresponsible development taking place in my community. So once again, I will ask the Premier Jen. through you, who advised him to overturn the Midtown and Focus plan, eliminating height restrictions and increasing the underlying value of the real estate, and are they the same people who stand to profit from these changes? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. There you have it, Mr. Speaker. There you have it from the Liberals right there, right? Not in my backyard. That is what 15 years of Liberal government brought to the province of Ontario. The member's Order. own question is against building homes in her community, and that is why we are in a housing crisis. So when you put their nimbyism on top of their nimbyism, the radicalness of the NDP, with the inability of the Liberals to ever accomplish anything. You have a housing crisis, but you know what we're doing? We're untangling the mess. But, Mr. Speaker, it's even more than that. It's high interest rates. Why? Because of policies of the Liberals. We had a Liberal cabinet minister on TV the other day say the only reason that there's tax relief on the carbon tax in Atlantic Canada is because Liberal members there said something about it, Mr. Speaker. So why don't the Liberals here and the Liberal MPs in Ontario say something about it, do something to bring more affordability to the people of Ontario instead of sitting on your butts and doing that? Members will take their seats. The House will come to order so we can continue question period. The member for Brantford Prant would like to place his question if his colleagues will allow him. Order. The opposition will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate that. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Great minister. The carbon tax is hurting our farmers, hurting our families, and hurting our businesses. The carbon tax raises the price of everything, especially for our businesses, who have no choice but to either absorb the loss or pass on the cost to their customers. The massive cost of the carbon tax is unsustainable for the people of Ontario. Speaker, the carbon tax's effects are widespread, including negative impacts to industries in the natural resources sector. Any barrier that creates delays and financial hardships in this sector negatively impacts Ontario's growth and economic prosperity. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax has impacted the natural resources, forestry, and wood sectors here? In Ontario. Thank you. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Oh, thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for the question. It's an important question because the carbon tax does impact lumber. It does impact the forestry sector. I just got a letter the other day, Speaker, from the president of the Ontario Forest Industries Association, and here's what they said. The next scheduled increase of the federal carbon tax on April 1st will have significantly damaging impacts on our sector. Fuel costs impact every stage of the supply chain within the economy and have compounding 
negative effects on industry competitors. And let's think about that. Let's think about the contractor getting in his truck to drive to the forest to do his work, paying carbon tax. Let's think about the equipment used to take down a tree, more carbon tax. Let's think about the trucks that take the logs out of the bush, more carbon tax. Let's think of the milling process, more carbon tax. Let's think of getting the lumber to market, Response. more carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, this tax has got to go. We've got to scrap the tax. It's in the cost of every new home in Ontario. The supplementary question. Speaker, you know what the worst part about the carbon tax is? Is that it's only going to get worse. The federal government, independent liberals and opposition NDP want to nearly triple this regressive tax by 2030. This means fuel prices will increase, creating a chain reaction of rising costs throughout the economy. For example, the price to move and process lumber will go up. This will cause the price of transporting two-by-fours to the store also to increase. Ontario companies, especially those in rural, remote and northern communities, are already struggling every single day to stay competitive and viable due to many fiscal pressures. In this time of economic and affordability uncertainty, let's not tax Ontarians more. Speaker, can the minister please share further details Question. regarding how the carbon tax negatively impacts Ontario's natural resources sector and our entire economy? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. You know, Speaker, I've had the chance to talk about the forestry sector, but let's look at the aggregate sector too, something that is needed to build Ontario. And look at the different ministries down the line here that All need aggregates to get their projects done, and every single load of those aggregates subjected to carbon tax. The Minister of Health wants to build new hospitals, yep. carbon tax. tax. The Minister of Long-Term Care wants to build new homes, carbon, carbon tax. tax. The Minister of Transportation wants to build new roads, carbon, carbon tax. tax. The Minister of Infrastructure has myriad projects she wants to build, more carbon, carbon tax. tax. Mr. Speaker, the resources that we need to build Ontario are subject to a carbon tax that has got to stop. We have got to scrap this tax. The members opposite know it. They've heard this message time and time again from Ontarians. They do nothing. They've got Response. to do something to help Ontarians. Scrap the tax. Members will take their seats. The House will come to order. 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 Start the clock. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For nearly two years now, the Ford government has refused to give Toronto the green light to move ahead with inclusionary zoning, which would require developers to build some affordable homes in new big developments. So this feels like a double standard. We've got the government letting lobbyists quickly rewrite official plans to benefit their speculator friends, but at the same time, this government is dragging its heels on making sure developers do their part to solve the affordable housing crisis. So this is my question to the Premier. When will this government stop blocking Toronto's inclusionary zoning law and allow the construction of much needed affordable homes? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, uh, we're working very closely with the City of Toronto on its, uh, on its uh, official plan, but you know, we just heard from the member from Don Valley who doesn't want to build homes in, uh, in her community. The member for University of Rosedale who is in agreement with us that more lands needed to be opened up with respect to building more homes. I'm delighted to hear that she's, uh, unlike her leader and her party, that she agrees with us that we need to build more homes and we need to do it in a different fashion. I was actually just in the member's community announcing uh, two towers uh, of rental housing, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think over 600 units of purpose-built rental housing. And you know why that's getting done? I'm glad you asked, Mr. Speaker. The reason, the reason, Speaker, that that is getting done is because this Premier and that Finance Minister f fought tooth and nail with the federal government to remove the HST from purpose-built rentals. And you know what that means? That means thousands of dollars in savings per unit, which is unleashing purpose-built rental housing like never be before. We're at the highest starts in over 30 years because of the policies of this government that that member continuously votes against. Supplementary question. 
I thank you. My question is back to the Premier. Toronto has been waiting nearly three years for the government to approve the 59-home supportive housing project at 175 Cummer Avenue in Willowdale. And now as they wait for the approval of these already constructed homes, they currently sit empty in a warehouse and the City of Toronto is spending a million dollars a year paying for that warehouse to keep them in storage. And at the same time, this project at 175 Kummer is facing opposition from a conservative donor who is building luxury homes across the street. So you say yes to luxury homes, but when it comes to supportive housing, crickets. When will this government give the green light to build these supportive housing homes in Willowdale so that we can house people who have no home at all? I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can reply. Speaker, you can't make this stuff up from these guys, right? This is the same member and a party that yesterday was railing against the MZOs that are building socialized housing in their community, right? There's five, I think there's six MZOs that we gave to build affordable housing in their community, and the members opposite Her. Want, don't want it to happen. Now, all of a sudden, they want it to happen. So what is it? You actually want housing Order. or you don't want housing, right? They're so busy fighting with each other, they have no idea what it is that they're asking for. The Liberals have no idea. The member for Don Valley doesn't want to build housing. This member wants to build it sometimes, but maybe not all the time, Mr. Speaker. The only party that the people of the province of Ontario can rely upon to get the job done is the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. Four housing supply action plans. Uh, housing at its highest level in 30 years. Housing starts at their highest Order. level in over 15 years, Mr. Speaker. The people of the province of Ontario know a progressive Conservative government will give them a bigger, better, stronger Ontario. And the Order. The next question, the member for Canada, Carleton. Thank you, Speaker. There are more than there are more than 100,000 children living in poverty in Ontario. There are more than 12,000 Ontario children on a surgery wait list in Ontario. There are more than 60,000 children on the Ontario Autism Program wait list for therapy and services in Ontario. With just a fraction of $8.3 billion, these children could be helped. But it's not just the Greenbelt. Now this government has decided to spend $650 million on a parking garage for a privately owned exclusive spa. My question to the Premier, can you possibly explain how this government's priorities are so skewed towards privileged insiders question. and friends instead of Ontario's children? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Okay. This is a member who sat in Ottawa and voted in favour of a carbon tax. And who does the carbon tax hurt? Well, we've heard. We've heard from Order. experts now that it is hurting every single Canadian, right? Every single Canadian. We've heard the skyrocketing food prices. Why? Because of a carbon tax that that member voted in favour of, Mr. Speaker. We, she's sitting in a caucus where they accomplished literally nothing. Did they build hospitals in Ottawa? No, Mr. Order. Speaker. Did they build transit or transportation in Ottawa? No, Mr. Speaker. Did they build long-term care? No, Mr. Speaker. In the member's own writing, we are building more long-term care than they built in the entire province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is the record of this government, Order. Speaker. So I say to the member opposite, do us a favour. Call your former colleagues in Ottawa, the ones who are sitting on their hands along Response. with the caucus here, and ask them to do what the Atlantic Canadian Liberal MPs did, demand that the carbon tax be removed. Because if they do that, we'll get progress, and it's not just us fighting for the people of Ontario. Stop the call. It's continuing to be very noisy in here. So I'm going to start uh, calling out members by name if they are interjecting. Start the clock. The supplementary question. The minister's answers completely ignores the hundreds of thousands of children in need in Ontario. Speaker, the children of Ontario deserve a government acting in their best interests. The Green Belt scandal. 
the criminal investigation, the Ontario Place scandal, the MZO scandal, it all serves the best interests of select insiders. How many RCMP criminal investigations, how many scandals, how many betrayals before this government starts governing for the people of Ontario instead Order. of governing for the rich and privileged friends? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Liberal Mr. Speaker, the members of the Liberal Caucus should be the last to talk about integrity when they are facing multiple investigations and, and charges. So I would just point that out. When it comes to support for children and youth and families across this province, Mr. Speaker, it's been this government, it's been this Premier. We just recently announced a $330 million pediatric support thanks to the Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker. We we increased funding to the street and nutrition program so that no student is left hungry in our schools, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We increased, we doubled the Ontario Autism Program funding by $300 million and further increased it by 10 percent again this year, Order. Mr. Speaker. Why? Fine. Why? Because none of these were done by the previous Liberal yeah, government, okay. and the NDP, when they had the opportunity, the balance of power did nothing. Stop the call. Stop the call. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order, and the member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was surprising and unexpected to hear a federal cabinet minister state that the provinces that are looking for relief from the carbon tax should elect more Liberal MPP, MPs. Shameful. I could hardly believe it. This is unheard of. In fact, it was a shocking admission by the federal government about the lack of respect for the concerns of the people of Ontario and other provinces across our country. The reality is that we can see the negative impact that the carbon tax is having on the cost of everyday essential items that people need. While Ontarians struggle to cope with the high costs, politics is not the answer to address affordability issues. Speaker, can the minister please share what our government is doing to continue to reduce costs for all Ontarians? Great. And to respond, the Minister of Energy. Thank you very much uh, to the member opposite for the question. Um, just yesterday, the Premier was out talking about the fact that we're extending the gas tax rebate by 10 cents a litre. We know that the federal carbon tax is driving that up by 14 cents a litre every year, Mr. Speaker. Our government is the one that removed license plate sticker fees, uh, saving motorists all across the province a significant amount of money every year, Mr. Speaker. And that's something that the federal government can't get their hands on. So that was a tangible thing that's in the pockets of the people of Ontario. The Ontario electricity rebate, which was announced a couple of weeks ago, is reducing the cost of electricity for customers all across the province by 15 to 17 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's farmers, that's small businesses and homeowners, Mr. Speaker. And we also have the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the CER, which reduces the cost Spons. of electricity for our industrial customers, Mr. Speaker. It was very disheartening on Thursday last week when the Prime Minister came out and announced a carve-out from the carbon tax for only Atlantic Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I share the Minister's views that the federal government has to cre create confusion and is unfortunately sowing division. Clearly, this approach works against the best interest of Ontarians. Further, the independent Liberals and opposition NDP are out of touch when it comes to understanding the hardships facing the people of Ontario because of the carbon tax. The people of Ontario are struggling with the rising costs of food, fuel, and everyday essential items because of this regressive and harmful tax. Our government has a strong record of successful measures that can, make, that can make life more affordable. 
It's time for the federal government to reconsider this approach and act in the best interest of all Gentlemen. Ontarians by eliminating the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the detrimental carbon tax is affecting the people of Ontario? Good Minister of Energy. Thanks, Speaker. We've heard from uh, cabinet ministers and members of uh, provincial parliament from the Progressive Conservative Caucus again this morning about the impact that the federal carbon tax is having on aggregates, the impact that it's having on the forestry sector, the impact it's having on the agriculture sector, on economic development. Mr. Speaker, in spite of all the harm that that federal carbon tax is doing to residents in Ontario, we're continuing to see our economy thrive, Mr. Speaker, because we have cut taxes, we have cut cut fees. We've created an environment in Ontario for multi-billion dollars of new investment in the electric vehicle sector, in the EV battery sector, green steel making, Mr. Speaker. We have a great track record on reducing emissions and reducing the cost of business and putting Ontario back on the map, Mr. Speaker. But the federal government has to come to the table and realize that they're not just hurting Atlantic Lots. Canadians, that they're hurting Canadians from coast to coast to coast, Mr. Speaker, and that includes here in Ontario. It's time to scrap the tag. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. New Democrats know that dental care is health care. All Ontarians should have access to timely dental care with their OHIP card, not a credit card. Heather, who lives in Windsor, was told there was a year-long wait list for her to see a dentist through the Ontario Seniors Dental Program. After seven months, she received a call to tell her she no longer qualified for the program because she makes too much money. Heather makes $90 over the $22,200 income limit for seniors, a situation many seniors in my riding and across the province are experiencing. Speaker, when will the Conservatives prioritize seniors' health care and increase the income limit for the seniors' dental care program? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the question from the member opposite because there is no doubt that while Ontario is leading Canada in providing uh, coverage for our individuals most in need, whether that is through uh, dental care programs in our school programs, through our public health units, more needs to be done. It is exactly why in the uh, last fall economic statement we made an additional investment of 17 million dollars we'll continue to make sure that those investments um, ensure that patients and individuals like your constituent and across ontario get access but there is no doubt as the federal government tinkers with what they are going to do with the dental plan federally and giving that uncertainty um, leads to frankly confusion within the provincial territory uh, conversations as we Response. try to manage a program that we have done very well in the past and we need to have a federal partner who understands where they're going so that we can match. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, while well, the Minister of Health deflects to the federal government, food bank usage here in Ontario has increased, homelessness has increased, opioid overdoses have increased, ER closures have increased, code reds and code blacks for paramedics has increased. Under your government, not the federal government, your responsibility. Speaker, Heather's income is well below the poverty line, yet the Conservatives think she earns too much and doesn't deserve dental care. Frances Hart had a similar experience with the Seniors Dental Program. Francis hadn't seen a dentist for years because he couldn't afford to. In July, after waiting months for an appointment through the government's program, Francis had to have all of his upper teeth removed. He was told to come back in a few months for dentures. When he returned, he was told he no longer qualified for the program. The government basically said, tough luck, either live on liquids or live in even deeper poverty by earning less. So my question is, when will the Premier stop treating question. dental care as a luxury that seniors must try to save up for or go without? Minister of Health. $17 million investment that was a result of the fall economic statement, of course, the NDP opposite voted against. But I'm going to give you some very specific examples of what that investment purchased, because frankly, if you have not seen it in your own community, you should make the effort to. I have. That investment supports new and renovated dental clinics and the procurement of additional mobile dental buses, including in Windsor, to connect more seniors to the care they need 
closer to home. As I said, we will continue to make those investments. I just wish that the member opposite and the NDP party would start to support those investments, and then we can work together. In the meantime, we'll get the job done. Order. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Since the introduction of the carbon tax, production costs for farmers like Graham Green of Abbey Hill Farms in Richmond, greenhouse growers like Devin and Ben Allen of Suntech Greenhouse in Manitick, and food processors all across the province have risen substantially. The delivery of every single consumer good in our province, particularly fresh and processed food, is being affected by one of the most economically harmful taxes our province has ever seen. The carbon tax harms hard-working individuals, businesses, and farmers. It provides absolutely no value other than taking money from families. The carbon tax mm. increases the cost of transporting inputs like seed, fertilizer, and packaging that drives up the cost of transporting fruits and vegetables to market. Question. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain what impact this harmful and regressive tax is having on our agricultural sector? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, the question very much because it allows me in this House to stand up and, and speak on behalf of Ontario farmers. They've told me over the last couple of weeks that cost of production this year alone have jumped 20 to 30 percent, and that translates into horrendous prices at the grocery store. And you know, a farmer told me once that he can manage fluctuations in commodity prices. He can adapt to changing weather conditions, but what worries him and keeps him up at night is bad ideology. And let me tell you very clearly, there's no worse ideology than the Liberal carbon tax, because we need to face the facts. Right now, carbon tax is at a rate of $65 per tonne. Under the Liberal federal government, in six short years, they want to see that rate increase to $170 oh, wow. per tonne. We can't afford life under the federal Liberal government now and their carbon tax. God help us all if that Liberal federal government is allowed to continue. We need to scrap that tax. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The reality is that under the carbon tax system, farmers, processors and grocers are forced to raise their prices because of this harmful and regressive tax. In 2022 alone, Ontario's greenhouse growers were assessed and forced to pay an additional $12 million under the federal carbon tax regime. This resulted in a tax of approximately $3,400 per acre on fresh fruits and vegetables. This is unacceptable and simply not fair. Unlike the independent Liberals and opposition NDP, who are content in hurting our farmers by supporting this regressive carbon tax, we believe that Ontario-grown food must remain on the shelves without interruption. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain why our food producers are being punished with a carbon tax? Thank Question. you. Excellent. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And I agree with the member opposite. Our farmers throughout Ontario are being punished by a ridiculous liberal ideology that is driving this carbon tax to increase the cost of production and ultimately the cost of everything, and it is unsustainable. And you know what's really worrisome for me? is that ideology is being sustained because just last week, Liberal-leaning senators absolutely gutted C-234. That was a bill that would see farmers exempted for heating barns and drying grains and oil seeds. That would have saved hundreds of millions of dollars across this pro uh, province and Canada. And quite frankly, with that gutting of C-234, Cost of productions are going to continue to rise. Fonts. Ladies and gentlemen, do the honourable thing. Join our government and stand up against bad liberal ideology that's doing nothing but drive up the cost of living in Thank you. And again, I'll remind members to make the comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today is the first day of November where people across the world raise awareness of health issues affecting men, such as prostate cancer. In 2022, close to 25,000 men were diagnosed with prostate cancer, 
and close to 5,000 lost their lives. That's our dads, our brothers, our uncles, and our grandparents. Early detection, prevention and detection saves lives. 100% of the men live five years with early detection. But this government voted down my motion to expand PSA testing for prostate cancer, which is critical to early detection. It's been nearly a year since the Conservatives voted down my motion. Since then, 4,600 men have died. Eight provinces, three territories cover the cost of the test, and nine in ten Canadians support increased government health care Question. spending on the test for early detection. Why are the Conservatives ignoring the recommendations of doctors, experts, and patients with prostate cancer by refusing to cover the PSA test as men die every single day? Thank you. To respond, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, and I know this is an issue that is very important to the member opposite, as it is to all of us in this chamber. Uh, we will continue to follow that clinical guidance, but I do agree that early detection is so important, which is why I was so proud to be able to stand earlier this week and announce that mammograms for women 40 to 50 are going to be available for some people. It truly is all about early detection and empowering individuals to make decisions based on their health. We'll continue to work with clinical advice and experts to make sure that as we move forward, those types of decisions, when they are appropriate, will be announced. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.